Hi everyone, welcome to this lesson. The title of this lesson is Andrew Dix and his essay, Film and Narrative. What's a narrative? A narrative can be defined as a spoken, textual, visual or gestural explanation or description of a real or imaginary occurrence or object. At times, the word story is used in the sense of a narrative. Narrative can be factual or fictional. A narrative is a perspective or point of view. A mingling of facts and fiction is also possible in a narrative. Depending on the person who provides the account of something or someone, narrative can be categorized as first person narrative or second person narrative or third person narrative. In the case of first person narrative, the usage of pronouns I or we will be predominant. If the narrative point of view is the pronoun you, we can call it a second person narrative. Second person narratives are very rare. He or she or they are the personal pronouns generally used in third person narrative. To narrate means to tell something. A narrative generally has a beginning, middle and an end, though not always in the same order. One can begin or start the story from the middle and go forward and backward. It is also possible to describe an event from the end in a flashback mode. A narrative could be oral, literary, visual, or audio visual. Though exceptions are there, cinema is basically a combination of visual, audio, textual narrative, where the visual elements dominate over audio and textual elements. Narratology is the structured study and theory of various types of narratological practices. Vladimir Probe a Russian folklorist laid the foundations of modern narratology with his book Narratologia Saski or Morphology of the Folktale, published for the first time in 1928. By understanding the various aspects of narratives, we can recognize, categorize and evaluate the storyline of a movie. The book Beginning Film Studies written by Andrew Dix is a very useful book both for beginners of film studies as well as for teachers of film studies. Andrew Dix is a faculty in the Department of English, Loughborough University in the United States of America. This book is divided into 10 chapters. As mentioned in its introduction, this book provides insights into the following aspects related to the study of cinema. I quote, a knowledge of conceptual shifts in 20th century film studies, a vocabulary for the analysis of film form and style, a sense of ideological dimensions of film, an awareness of key post-textual or extra-textual domains of film studies, and a prospectus of possible directions for film studies in the 21st century. Film and Narrative is the fourth chapter of Beginning Film Studies where Andrew Dix discusses various categories, theories and practices of narratives in the context of cinema. Learning objectives of this module are to enable the learner to read and understand the contents of the essay prescribed for study and to comprehend what is narrative and narratology and to apply the knowledge on narratology in the context of films. Andrew Dix begins the essay Film and Narrative by inviting our attention to two warring factions within cinema makers and scholars. I would label them as the narrativist camp and the anti-narrative camp. The narrativist camp believed that cinema is a machine for storytelling. The defenders of anti-narrative cinema, I quote, seek to explore the medium's imagistic, 
graphic or material properties rather than its facility for storytelling." Unquote. Andrew Dix. From 1895 till the 1920s, it was a time of cinema of attractions as described by the film scholar Tom Gunning. Both for the filmmakers and for the audience, the cinematic image's capacity to arouse and maintain human curiosity was a primary factor which attracted human beings towards cinema. Early cinemas, optical magic was enough to hypnotize both the audience and the filmmakers of the time. Therefore, early filmmakers of the time, like Louis Lumiere, Thomas Alva Edison tried to select, shoot and screen most visually engaging events that would hold the attention of their audience. Technologically mediated novelty of the cinematic work of art attracted people in the beginning, not because of what the story tells, but for the sheer presence of this attractive, curious medium itself. The narrative content or the storyline of early cinema played only a minor part in attracting the audience to theatres. However, with the advancement of assorted cinematic technologies and the arrival of longer movies in larger numbers by 1920s, they developed a film language which had the visual lexicon capable enough to tell stories through the medium of cinema. Here actually begins the narrative phase of cinema. A few cinema experimentalists or avant-garde filmmakers like Jean Epstein even commented that narrative cinema as a lie. On the contrary, film theorists like Peter Wollen believe that, I quote, and there is no doubt about it, it has to be for narrative." Unquote. While discussing some of the anti-narrativist approaches to cinema, Andrew Dix brings our attention to the peculiar idiosyncratic movie-watching behavior of some of the anti-narrativists like the French surrealists. These surrealists used to hope from one movie to the other quickly without watching any movie incomplete. Instead, they experienced movies in fragments, in discontinuity and in jumbled order. This is done to prove the philosophical point that narrative is not at all a necessary prerequisite to enjoy cinema and storytelling is an uncinematic and incompatible ingredient in cinema as a medium of expression. The film Ancien and Love, 1928, directed by the two French surrealist artists Louis Bunuel and Salvador Dali, is the finest example of anti-narrativist approaches to cinema. In this film, images and sequences with temporal spatial and narrative disunity are juxtaposed to create a unique psychological sensation. Characters who have no counterparts in the realistic world, happenings that defy logical explanation, images that have no parallel earthly existence are clubbed here to resist the argument that cinema is a medium which requires a narrative thread. The second film of Bunuel and Dali, Lag Dor, 1930, also testifies the avant-garde experimentalism which tried to resist the wedding of images with a storyline. I quote, all these ventures, however, may look marginal or aberrant given the 20th century's massive institutionalization and globalization of narrative film. This privileging of narrative form extends into the discipline of film studies as well, unquote, argues Andrew Dix. So, narrative or the storyline of a film plays a key role in cinema, especially 
when cinema is an industrial entertainment art produced for sale in the global market for making profit. Even though the computer generated still graphics and video graphics and fresh sound combinations still remind us of the cinema of attractions, narrative in cinema maintains its firm grip, especially in the commercial context. In the first section of the essay, which is subtitled as Russian Formalists at the Cinema, Andrew Dix details the indirect contributions of Vladimir Prop to film studies. The phrase Russian Formalists originally refers to a diverse group of literary critics comprising Viktor Shlovsky, Vladimir Prop, Roman Jacobson, Russian formalists celebrated the formal and autonomous linguistic properties of literature. Based on clinical textual analysis, formalist critics highlighted the structural, stylistic, semantic uniqueness of a work of art without considering the other metaphysical and extra textual considerations. Russian formalism had its peak influence in the second and third decades of the 20th century, especially on structuralism and post-structuralism. Russian formalist theorization, especially of the body or structural specificities of work of art, was later on extended to Soviet cinema by Sergei Eisenstein, Diziga Vertov, and Lev Kuleshov. Word of film, man with a movie camera can be called as an example of Russian formalism in praxis where the materiality and structure of the film makes it unique rather than the narrative. Amongst the formalists, Vladimir Prop worked on Russian folk tales rather than on cinema. His empirical discoveries on the structural and thematic codes across Russian folk tales are described in the book Morphology of the Folk Tale, 1928. Andrew Dix says that Prop's, I quote, Pioneering morphology of folktale identifies the twofold nature of traditional tales he analyzed. On the one hand is that amazing multiformity, picturesqueness and color, all of the surface details what vividly differentiate one story from another. But on the other is the no less striking uniformity the sense of repetition from one story to the next." Unquote. In Propian analysis, the structure of folk tales can be divided into 31 functions. A function is a fundamental formal element. In the folk tale tradition, the function begins with absentation of the folk tale hero and ends with his wedding. The initial disappearance of the hero unsettles the status quo and final wedding which brings back the unity and settlement. Indictments against the hero, his liquidation, his transfiguration and the recognition he gets towards the end are some other functions. Vladimir Prop also discovers seven types of characters or spheres of action found in general in folk tales. They are the hero, the princess, the villain, the false hero, the donor, the helper, and the dispatcher. Such formal functions and character types work at the syntactic level, not at the paradigmatic level, according to Claude Lévi-Strauss, who was a structuralist critic. Andrew Dix mentions that the straight application of the Propian model to the study of film is criticized by David Bobel in his article, Appropriations and Improprieties, Problems in Morphology of Film Narrative. 
According to Andrew Diggs, I quote, flexibly deployed, however, props narratology has many uses in the analysis of filmic storytelling. Its example encourages us to suspend the myriad local differences of films we watch and enquire instead into the possibility of group resemblances between these works. Most obviously, it enables the identification of recurrent narrative patterns and character types within a given genre." Unquote. Vladimir Probst's conceptualizations of 31 functions and seven spheres of narratives can be used as a template in the context of film studies too, especially to understand and analyze cinematic narrative categories both across and within each cinematic genre. To prove his point, Andrew Dick says that, I quote, for all lurid differences, Scorsese's neo-noir Taxi Driver and John Ford's Western, The Searchers, 1955, share a sequence of functions as common set of spheres of action for character types. In addition to this, prop schema can be used to analyze the functions and spheres of a filmmaker's entire body of works. How can we address the question of cultural diversity of the world, especially reflected through folk and fairy tales, while accepting propian model for narrative analysis is another important point raised by Andrew Dix in his essay. Though the functional and spherical categories may be slightly or greatly different in other traditions of reality and literature, Still, we can draw some analogies with the Propian schema. I quote, Prop is useful too in encouraging a higher level of abstraction in thinking about character in film, unquote, Andrew Dix. Andrew Dix winds up this section by a customization of Prop's model is necessary when we apply it in film studies. As Propian approach is based on verbal material, many times this approach could reduce films to their bare narrative alignments. The next part of Andrew Dix's essay elaborates how time works in motion picture. As far as the Propian model is concerned, folk tales strictly follow a chronological sequence. However, Temporal reshufflings, as remarked by film scholar David Bordwell, are relatively exceptions in films. In cinematic practice of temporal representation, proprian chronological sequence will not be applicable many a time. Another important contribution to understand narrative is provided by another formalist colleague of Vladimir Prop, Viktor Shlowski, who distinguishes between the fabula, the story, and sujet, the plot. Fabula means the arrangement of events in a narrative in chronologically linear way, where the earliest event is narrated first and the concluding event gets narrated at the end. Sujet, on the other hand, refers to the plot, where events could be rearranged in different chronological order. David Warbel says that Sujet names the architectonics of the film's presentation of the fabula. So, fabula is the narrative event and Sujet is the peculiarly temporal description of the event, probably with temporal reshufflings. There are two basic types of temporal arrangements of the fabula in cinema, analepsis and prolepsis. Analepsis means flashback and prolepsis means flash forward. Dissolves usages of monochrome sequences, close upping of characters face, blurred cinematography and intertitles are some of the 
techniques used in cinema to suggest a flashback. Various functions of the cinematic flashback include clarification of the past, to fill in the gaps in narrative, to disambiguate the story, to add another layer to the narrative, etc. Andrew Dix cites D.W. Griffith's film Intolerance, 1916, as one of the earliest instances for the usage of flashback technique in film. Here, flashback is used once to exonerate the hero of the charge of murder. In Orson Welles' film Citizen Kane, 1941, flashbacks contribute to the narrative complexity of the film. I quote, where each new segment of the narrated past fails to clarify Kane's history because it provides evidence that runs counter to other flashbacks." Unquote, by Andrew Dix. Comparing usages of analepsis or flashback and prolepsis or flash-forward techniques in film, Andrew Dix offers a clear clarification. He says, I quote, the flashback is by now a familiar piece of film's storytelling grammar, where it is clearly marked off from the narrative present. It is accepted, even naturalized by spectators. However, the structurally opposite device of prolepsis is used less often and remains potentially disorienting. Whereas the flashback evokes the routine working of memory, prolepsis has connotations of order mental processes like prophecy and premonition and thus seems genuinely uncanny." Unquote. Alain Resnas, La Gure S. Finn, The War is Over, 1968 is given as an example for filmic prolepsis by Andrew Dix. Time in cinema can be expanded, frozen, fastened, condensed, repeated, erased and also it can keep at real time speed. Film made with real time, the film completes with the exact completion of the events films. Such real-time films may maximize tension and can also intensify audiences' responses to the details of the events shown. The Iranian film White Balloon, directed by Jafar Panahi, is often cited as an example of real-time film. I quote, a film's sujet may revise not merely the order of events in the fabula, but also their duration for speed and frequency, unquote, Andrew Dix. Time in cinema can be extended by showing an event from different angles or perspectives through, I quote, overlapping editing, cutting together shots of the same event so that it lasts longer than on screen than in actuality. Eisenstein uses this tactic in his film October when a bridge is raised to prevent the revolutionary crowd's progress. This distribution to mundane temporal unfolding invites reflection on the image's political resonance. Besides affecting duration, overlapping editing offers a small-scale version of narrative repetition and thus has implication for further questions of frequency in storytelling." Unquote. Gerard Jeannet describes three types of frequencies in narration. They are singulative, iterative, and repetitive. In singulative narration, there will be only one 
time narration of an event. In iterative narrative style, multiple events may be presented through a single narration. A single event will be narrated repetitively in repetitive narrative format. Japanese filmmaker Akira Kurosawa's film Rashomon 1950 follows the repetitive narrative pattern where we have multiple accounts of the death of the samurai through three persons, the wife of the dead samurai, a gangster and a woodcutter. The next subsection of the essay, Film and Narrative by Andrew Dix, is on different types of ending in narrative films. Most of the classical Hollywood films have a conclusive, credible, closed ending. However, experimental filmmakers often resist such symptoms of Americanism as far as ending of a movie is concerned. Most of the Indian classic Bollywood family film drama ends with the wedding of the lead male character with the lead female character. According to Sevan Todorov, the French theorist, the formula of classic Hollywood is from equilibrium to disequilibrium, then to final equilibrium restored. The political ideology of the film practices within the filmmaking studios, signature style of Ottawa filmmakers, film genres, and the taste of the audience can also influence the ending of film. Laura Mulvey, one of the major feminist film theorists, believes that concluding a film with a freeze frame may actually be more resistant to the sense of termination than other endings. This section is concluded with the following statements by Andrew Dix. I quote, if the stereotypical Hollywood ending might stand for the ideologically conservative position that everything is now defined and complete, other cinematic endings, including even some death-like frozen frames, evoke alternative political possibility that the world is still up for grabs and open to reinvention." Unquote. The concluding thematic section of the chapter, Film and Narrative, is subtitled Narrative and Power. This section shows how powers of different kind, ranging from individual agency to ideological apparatuses, institutional authority, are shown and distributed through the body of a film narrative. Objective short or nobody short and subjective short or points of view short, cinematic voiceover, the gender gaze of the director executed through the cinematography, etc., adds to the distribution of power sites in a movie. Andrew Dix explains the operation of power in the context of cinema in the following words. I quote, because of the medium's ocular bias, the question of setting or perspective is literal and urgent here. Much in cinema, certainly within the mainstream tradition, point of view tends not to explicitly marked. An objective shot, according to Francesco Cassetti, is a nobody's shot, which suggests a disembodied perspective that does not prioritizes anyone's perspective. However, a subjective shot or a point of view shot represents the perspective of one of the characters in the frame or that of a private eye. All the characters in a movie are not given viewing positions. It's in this allowance and denial of the viewing positions to characters lies the power distribution and power denial of cinema. Most often in the mainstream films, the male protagonist is allotted most of the viewing positions, including voyeuristic moments. I quote, if the power to see within film narrative is only seldom available to characters themselves, 
should we say that the same thing about power to speak or narrate immediately we think of cases where some of the film storytelling labor is delegated to a voice over that is usually though not always spoken by a figure in the narrative itself while the device is not consistently in favor it has been institutionalized in certain genres notably the classic film noir as well as traditional documentary uncut and rudic says the chapter concludes with andrew dick's narrative analysis of the american film 21 grams 2003 directed by alejandro gonzales thank you for watching the video